Hi there. Over on Twitter, in the aftermath of the truncated House of the Dragon Season 2 finale, I sarcastically made a poll asking, Hey, now that everyone's soured on House of the Dragon, should I switch my YouTube channel to covering wild cards instead? And people on Twitter didn't understand that I was joking. <laughs> I have learned from that because originally I was going to start this video you're watching now with a fake opening where I pointed my camera at my desk and dramatically swept my Westeros books onto the floor and then started slapping down my Wild Cards books and comics and said, no, this is now a Wild Cards channel. This is what we're doing now. And I realized people wouldn't have understood it was a prank. It was a joke. So I'm not doing that. that okay, it's just... It brought up to me also that a lot of people on the Twitter poll didn't even know what Wild Cards was, because it's been a long time since this was even the butt of our jokes. I mean, relative to a decade ago, people kind of knew what Wild Cards was in the early 2010s, the early seasons of Game of Thrones, that people were annoyed that Martin would talk about it instead of the next book or whatever. So... Because not a lot of people even knew what it was, and for those who hate on it because he's mentioning it but actually don't know what the story is, I thought it might be a good idea to give a basic introduction to it. Given that by pure chance, okay, this poll was like just five days ago, and today is September 15th, which in the story verse is Wild Card Day. I'll explain what that is. So September 15th is their big event thing, so... Okay, it's like N7 for Mass Effect, so... September 15th, Wild Card Day. Because it gets a lot of criticism just for not being a Westeros project, I and it's not even something Martin exclusively writes, I want to give you a basic introduction, and it's actually a pretty good series. Now, I had wanted to do this really detailed with images and stuff. I'm sorry, there just isn't time... When I looked at my notes and realized I've got like eight pages of script here, I'm going to have to do this as an audio-only podcast, but you can search around for the exact images and everything. Basically, Wild Cards is a realistic, dark, gritty deconstruction of superhero comics, specifically riffing on X-Men comics, though all of them generally. Just as the A Song of Ice and Fire novels were Martin's hyper-realistic deconstruction of Tolkien-style high fantasy medieval epics, that imagine X-Men written in the style of one of the A Song of Ice and Fire chapters set in the slums of King's Landing. If you've actually read all of Martin's print A Song of Ice and Fire stories, and that's a small fraction of people have actually, you know, people claim they've read it, but when, if you've actually read every book start to finish, and you are active, because you're a reader, that you're actively looking for a new thing to physically read, yeah, I think if you've read everything else first, you might want to move on to this, because Wild Cards is sort of written in the same tone, but for an X-Men story. In fact... There's pretty strong comparisons between the tone of Wild Cards and Alan Moore's Watchmen, because they were both written in the 80s, and more recently, Robert Kirkman's Invincible. That basically, Wild Cards is George R. R. Martin's Invincible, which is now being adapted really successfully into animation at Amazon. But it's not quite Martin's X-Men. It's not Martin's, because... While he has written stories for Wild Cards, it's really an ongoing multi-author fictional universe, much like Marvel Comics or Image Comics, just that instead of starting out as visual format comic books, graphic novels, it started out in text format, even though it's a riff on comic books that most books in the Wild Card series are collected anthologies of short stories. And I love, you know, print anthologies, like when Star Wars has an anthology thing of various short stories from different perspectives, I like that it's a sampler. Usually they have a unifying theme or there's some other event, common event, like a presidential election that everyone is reacting to. Sometimes they're standalones, but they're usually uh, 
collections of short stories where they divide up writing duties by chapter. So sort of imagine if you had the shifting multi-character POV of the A Song of Ice and Fire novels, where you have like a Brienne chapter, and then a Jamie chapter, and then a Jon Snow chapter, a Daenerys chapter, but that those were actually assigned to different writers, and then coordinated by an editor. It, it's sort of like that for an X-Men type series. And Martin is one of the founders of it, but it's like, no one person made X-Men. I mean, that's the whole thing, particularly Marvel, their, their whole format was they had pitch meetings. Like, did Stan Lee create, create Spider-Man? Well, more than any other one person. But, you know, it was a collaborative thing. Or, like, Steve Ditko, uh, Chris Claremont really revitalized X-Men. He didn't originate it. Of Just who exactly, when you have these shared universes, there is really no one creator, creator, but there are prominent figures. And Martin is one of the bigger ones. And because he became a famous author for his other series, he promotes it a lot to help out the other less well-known writers that work on it. Because he's nice. He's helping them out with their series because he's their friend, and he writes a few things set in it. It actually originated from tabletop role-playing games that Martin and his circle of sci-fi author friends, they were all authors, played together in the early 1980s. And it was this game that lasted about two years, where they made this whole story verse and the why do people have superpowers and story arcs and characters. It was like Melinda Snodgrass was another big figure there, and a couple of others. Howard Waldrop was also one of the big early authors in it. But he was playing this epic sci-fi thing. Well, the thing of how like Critical Role became a thing with Amazon's Vox Machina with Dungeons and Dragons. It was we did this made a story for our tabletop game for two years, and because we were already authors, we said, hey, we should make this into short story format and make it an anthology book, because we came up with some really good ideas here. It just kind of grew organically. They said at the time they intended for this to be their answer to the state of comic books at the time keeping in mind that this was like 1984, 1985-ish, and a lot of comic creators were actually on the verge of the comics backlash we saw by the late 80s, where it got really adult and dark and gritty. That, I mean, 1986 was uh, Dark Knight Returns, Crisis on Infinite Earths, and then Secret Wars was Marvel's answer to that. But all the, the dark and gritty Batman had to be completely reinvented in the late 80s. You forget how bad things were in the early 80s. All this cool stuff we think of decades later was a response to that. And Martin had been, you know, a comic book fan since he was a child. He was involved in the early Comic-Cons. That part of that wave of Dark Knight Returns, Watchmen, Secret Wars, all of that mature stuff in the late 80s that was responding to it, they were part of that wave as an art movement of let's make something that's adult, gritty, it is in no way meant for kids, there's a lot of drugs and sex and violence in it, and it's very dark, and it coalesced, I mean, the only, this only trickled out to the, the pop culture by like 1989's Tim Burton Batman came as a shock to general audiences of Batman isn't silly, this is a dark story. And yes, I know there were some earlier things to, to fix. Like, Claremont's run on X-Men had already produced Dark Phoenix Saga in 1980. Uh, it was Days of Future Past 82, or I think it was 81, actually. But those are exceptions, that on the whole, comics are pretty silly in the early 80s. So, like Watchmen and all these other things, they rode the wave to make this really dark thing, because they were already sci-fi authors in their own right. Uh, because this was a dozen or so writers working collaboratively on story ideas they developed for a few years already, they had a big backlog when they went to publish it. That These were ideas they'd worked out, again, like Critical Hit with the whole Wilted Tabletop game, we worked it out already. The initial burst when they started in publishing in 1987... In that first burst, the first six years from 87 to 93... They published 12 books. 12 books in six years. There was more than one writer on it. It was like a dozen writers. So that makes sense. Of how were they able to do it that fast? Plus, they had already had a backlog of story ideas. On top of that, it's not as if Martin wasn't busy at the time. I mean, this is around when um, he shifted from writing a lot to 
to make money too he actually got into the tv industry at this point like the late 80s when he got to work on that twilight zone reboot at the time and then after that he was working on the linda hamilton ron perlman beauty and the beast tv series which i had to look this up ran for two seasons from 1987 to 1989 after that some stuff happened though but martin became disillusioned with the tv industry he tried this other series called gateways they did film a pilot i've seen it and that wasn't picked up so by 93 he was disillusioned with tv in general and shifted to screw it i'm gonna write this epic sprawling unfilmable thing and i got a great idea it'll be a song of ice and fire by 93 and three years later the first book came out in 96 but this is before that this is the 80s that that initial burst that established the universe, those six years in the early, late 80s, early 90s, where they came up with these 12 books really fast, these 12 anthology books, that he contributed a lot to that. He was the editor, and he still edited Wildcard stuff, though, through the 90s, though because they had to switch publishers a few times, the pace slowed after that initial burst. So, like, they shifted publishers, that was a mistake, that they did make stuff in the 90s, but from 93 to 2006, in contrast to before that, there were only six books in 12 years, as opposed to 12 books in six years. But then, things stabilized, and in 2008, Wild Cards, the Wild Cards author's circle switched to the publisher Tor Books, who they've used ever since, and so... From 2008 onwards, the current era of Wild Cards, they have been consistently putting out a new book every, like, year or two. I mean, they don't make headlines as much, but sometimes they have a three-year gap, sometimes they put out two in a, in a year, but we are getting, like, consistently at the rate, it, on average, like one every other year. And currently, as of this year, there are overall 32 books in the series. And it's not like, oh, how do I get into Marvel Comics? You don't have to literally read all of Marvel Comics, though you might want to, but, you know. But it's an open world that writers are allowed, to, other writers are allowed to tell stories in and play in that sandbox. So you don't have to read every single X-Men comic. You should read the first ones, just you read the first book just to get a sense of the world. And the rest will work itself out. So, by now, there's 32 books. There have been 13 since they switched to Tor in 2008. And keep that date in mind, that this new wave of wildcard stuff coming out very regularly starting in 2008. And, well, it, again, it, they're books. They're short stories about comic book heroes. But some of wildcard stories have been adapted into comic books and graphic novels. Which is great, because the visuals are so striking that they went with impossible designs that this could never... Because it's written as opposed to being drawn. The way some of the monsters in it are described in text is so unreal. And then artists were willing to try to draw some of them, just how crazy they are. It is amazing. But they've been adapted to a few comic books, and... Martin did, and I've, I've bought some of them over the years, but Martin did try to pitch a Wild Cards live-action TV show to different studios, and it stalled for years, never really amounted to anything, never went beyond the pitch phase. Technically, he still had a stalled Wild Cards project pitch at Peacock through, I think, last year is when they officially canceled it, but it was never greenlit, it was, it was never writers in a room it was we were pitching would peacock like to do wild cards and i think it's just they never got completely around to canceling it maybe he was waiting for new leadership that cycled out of there but i don't really think you can or should do it in the live action just the designs are too surreal i mean again in many ways it's comparable to robert kirkman's invincible and imagine the stuff they do on invincible and the creature designs in animation, in the Amazon cartoon series, you could do this with live actors, but so much CGI would have to be in there anyway that it might as well be a cartoon. That it gives you the freedom to do that. I mean, look at an X-Men live-action movie, I mean, a good movie, and even the stuff this year in, like, Deadpool and Wolverine, which is good CGI, compared to the uh, the crazy designs you can see for mutants and stuff in the animated X-Men 97 series that also came out this year. The animation is just the freedom of imagination. 
So I really think that in the future, it, stop pushing for live action for this. Try to get it made into a cartoon series. Maybe this could be Warner's answer to Amazon's Invincible. Just if you're familiar with it, it's that type of adult cartoon, although there's a war on adult cartoons in general these days, of just, if I was to list off the top five, top ten unmined ideas that would make a, a great adult cartoon series in that scale, this would be one of them, of why don't we have an Invincible show, why don't we have a wild card show, animation-wise. But new big section here. If you are new here because of House of the Dragon or you watched Game of Thrones but didn't really go online ten years ago, why do people in the online Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire community make fun of wild cards so much? Well, back in the late 2000s to early 2010s, Martin was regularly posting on his blog. I mean, he interacted with, the with fans. I interact. I, a lot of us managed to have him answer random comments in there. This is back when he did comments. Then, around season 5, 2015, his relationship with the show soured, and so many people were on there yelling at him about the show or the book not being finished that he disabled his comments forever. He hasn't opened them again since. But... Late 2000s, early 2010s, when he was blogging very regularly and interacting with fans on it about just various news updates, back in the day, fans were eager for each new A Song of Ice and Fire novel. Remember, the first three came out 1996 to 2000. Third one came out 2000. And then everyone had to wait five years for the fourth book in 2005. And for a book of that size, I think five to six years is a decent wait. That I am willing to wait five to six years for a book of that size. It is huge. It's that we had to wait another five to six years until book five, A Dance with Dragons, came out in 2011. And again, I actually think that was a respectable wait, given how long it is. But add six to, by 2017, we kind of thought we'd get Winds of Winter at the rate he was doing these big books, and then that didn't happen. But through, through 2017, I didn't think in 2013, where is Winds of Winter? You know, no one you would have reasonably thought this would suddenly come out faster than the last two. It's, it's silly. So you see, he was on his blog a lot, early, late 2000s, early 2010s. This was when people were eager for news about A Dance with Dragons. And right after A Dance with Dragons came out 2011, 2013-ish, it's, where's book six? Where's book six? Even though it's not going to come out in two years. But it, you see how it lined up with the resurgence of wild cards. That whereas they put out maybe six books within the last 10, 12 years before that, when they switched to Tor as a publisher, 2008 onwards, and they were putting out sometimes two books a year, or at least every other year, that they've had like 13 books since 2008. The joke for this like five to six year spread from like 2008 to 2015-ish was Martin would say, well, I haven't really made any progress on Winds of Winter, but I do have some news about a great new Wild Cards book. And the point is that he didn't personally write these Wild Card books anymore that he was promoting other writers who had some nice stuff that he wanted to talk about. And it's really the same way people make fun of how he'll blog about, I saw a good football game today. And it's like, he does that when he's not working. It's it, People were upset at anything other than news about Winds of Winter I don't want a blog post about. So, good-heartedly, some of us meant it as a good-hearted joke of, hey guys, have you heard about that great new Wild Cards book coming out? But... I knew what Wild Cards was and actually liked it. Just, hey, want some Wild Cards? But it's not that we hated it, but then some people really were hating on it. And this goddamn Wild Cards, you understand he isn't working on it. That I check this, that after that huge... This is like, he's like the Stan Lee, not the Chris Claremont. Chris Claremont came in the second wave of X-Men. He was part of that initial wave that invented the Wild Cards universe, that, those first 12 books. He was the editor for decades. But in terms of actually sitting down and writing books, after the mid-90s, when they only put out, like, two trilogies anyway, 
Since the mid-90s, Martin is only credited with actually writing exactly one short story. It's just one short story, not even a novella or a book or anything, for Wild Cards. When they relaunched with the new publisher Tor in 2008, just to help kick it off, he wrote a short story for the first relaunch book. I mean, they're not two continuities, just that it's relaunching into regularly making more content again. I mean, like when X-Men Comics relaunches with number one, but they don't reboot the continuity. It's just, oh, but we got a new production run after going on pause. Like, uh, like right before Dark Phoenix. Like, when they went on pause because of, um, in the early 60s, but then came back, and it's still the same continuity, but they were on pause production-wise for a bit, but they came back. That really, in terms of writing this, other than one short story just to, to do, and this is before the TV show was even filming, Game of Thrones is like 2008, Martin hasn't actually written, written for Wild Card since the 90s. He was helping to edit it. And at this point, I really think it's more that he delegates the editing to other people and that he slaps his name on the book in big letters, edited by George R. R. Martin, just to help promote it because it's a story verse that he's friends with the authors and he wants to help them that he's a better known writer than them because of his other series. So... People are were always hating on wild cards. And why isn't why is George doing wild cards instead of Winds of Winter? I don't think wild cards even impacted the writing of A Feast for Crows in two thousand five. He wasn't really working on it after two thousand that much, or just as any other little event he goes to. But it wasn't really something he was deeply invested in as a work thing. I mean, he reads it and he likes it, but in terms of writing in it, he's not really doing that anymore. So that's why I am playfully joking about, oh, you want to see some wild cards? Because I actually do like wild cards, but that's how it became a joke. But that was in the early 2010s, when Martin was still regularly blogging, and we were making fun of oh, yet another blog about wild cards, not progress on Winds of Winter. And now that's not really as much. People complain about all the other things he's promoting. But that's where the joke originated. Next big section here. What is the setting of Wild Cards like, specifically? That I said it's sort of a George R. R. Martin realistic, gritty adult take on X-Men. Meaning what specifically? Just in terms of the plot mechanics and everything. Well, I'm not going to go into specific stories and characters. Like, if you were to ask me to describe Marvel's X-Men comics... I wouldn't list off specific things like Dark Phoenix Saga, Asteroid M, but I'd tell you the general setting idea that all over the world, the next stage in human evolution is randomly appearing in people born with the X gene that gives them superpowers. They actually get discriminated against, and paralleling the civil rights divide between MLK and Malcolm X, some mutants follow Professor X, who pushes for peaceful coexistence with humans and mutant civil rights, and at the other end of the spectrum is the mutant extremist Magneto, who is convinced humans will never tolerate them, so they should use force to fight back. And then you have a lot of mutants in between who just plain abuse their powers as unaffiliated supercriminals, and the X-Men try to stop them. Like, that one paragraph is basically the overview of the entire X-Men series, setting-wise. Like, you don't need to get into all the... the... Krakoa stuff they're doing now, which is great, but it's really complicated, and I appreciate that Hickman thought it out in advance, but how do people get superpowers in X-Men? They're born with mutant gene. And Stan Lee admitted that he just came up with that as a quick, lazy answer, because it was easier than coming up with a case-by-case -case answer for every new comic book character's superpowers, that we'd have to come up with every new guy has his version of I was bit by a radioactive transgenetic spider, or just, we had to come, just say they're a mutant. We don't need to come up with reasons. But later writers refine this into, well, it's happening naturally, it's the next stage in human evolution, that there seems to be a purpose to this. Moving on now to how the Wild Cards universe works is a basic introduction. If you've never heard of it before, if you've heard the name, didn't really know what people are talking about, and it actually is a pretty good story verse as an idea. In the Wild Cards universe, people get superpowers from an alien bioweapon that, that was test fired on Earth. That there's an alien race from the planet Takis 
who are genetically and visually identically humans, but centuries more advanced. No one's sure why. The running theory is that Earth is a lost colony of theirs, but more probably it seems that the Tachesians must descend from humans who were abducted to space in ancient times, because the Tachesians do say, we know this isn't our original home planet, but it's lost to history. It's more likely they're the lost planet, but whatever. They're genetically identical humans, centuries more advanced, and on, they have, like, organic technology in their ships, um, and which they did through selective breeding and gene editing of space creatures. And on top of this, they've been selectively breeding themselves for generations, generations beyond count. So even though they're genetically similar to humans, their ruling class has psychic powers due to all of this selective breeding. And occasionally you do see a natural psychic among the regular human population on Earth, so they imply it's just through extreme selective breeding for the psychic gene they made themselves really psychic. And yes, there are strong parallels between them and the Valyrians in A Song of Ice and Fire, that they're this advanced technological society but ruled by feudal-style aristocratic houses who are constantly fighting each other, they said it's almost like medieval Italy or medieval Japan that there's these royal houses fighting each other even though they have organic spaceships and psychic powers and they're constantly fighting. They're not so, oh, we're so advanced, we're beyond war. No, it just made their fighting more brutal. One of these Takesian houses engineered a virus that they hoped would grant them even stronger psychic powers. But it didn't exactly work right that a small fraction of test subjects, I mean a small fraction, got random superpowers to the point they were like gods. But, like Superman, Wonder Woman scale things. But most te test subjects died or turned into monsters. And humans, after it gets released on Earth, they later nickname it the Wild Card Virus, because the small odds of not being killed by it or mutated, but actually getting superpowers, the actual odds are so incredibly small, and the process is so entirely random, that they use the analogy of it's like randomly picking from a deck of cards. That, I got the wild, it's a wild card, it could be anything until you play it. So the Takesians realize it isn't safe to use on ourselves, on our own Takesian house nor can we fire it as a weapon against other Tekesians, because it would kill a lot of them, but a few would be left with superpowers. So we can't use it on ourselves, which is the original point, to use it to make super-powered people. We can't use it on our enemies. So to try to get more field data, they said, hey, let's test fire it on Earth. They're genetically similar to us. One good Tekesian scientist, nicknamed Dr. Tachyon, who is loosely their Professor X figure, rushed to Earth to try to stop the bioweapon, and he managed to shoot it off course, but it was recovered by human criminals. And this is in 1946. It was recovered by human criminals who loaded it onto a blimp and tried to blackmail the government by flying this blimp with the alien virus on it, bomb on it, over New York City and threatening to detonate it unless they were paid blackmail money. So there's this blimp flying over the city, and the first chapter is called 30 Minutes Over Broadway, that there's this Zeppelin I I propeller jet fight over Broadway, <laughs> that the only ship that can, the only plane that can actually get high enough to get to the blimp is this test jet flown by, it's a riff on pulp comics, that, you know, like how comics progressed through eras that in the 30s there were pulp heroes who were like uh, Biggles, the test pilot, that kind of thing, that their 1930s hero was Jet Boy. I mean, he, by this point he was, you know, later than a teenager, but Jet Boy was this experimental jet pilot and his pulp villain guy was the guy that found the virus. So Jet Boy rushed in on his experimental jet, the only one that could reach the blimp that high, desperately trying to stop him. And he got onto the blimp, he, he limited the damage, but still, in the process, the blimp exploded, killing everyone on board, the bad guys and Jet Boy, and releasing the virus bomb into the jet stream. And it 
fell down from the sky. It hit New York first, but it was carried by the jet stream, so it hit a lot of other major cities over the next decade, and then just spread. But this happened on September 15th, 1946, which forever after would be known as Wild Card Day, this national global day of memorial on September 15th, that because this is, was the biggest load of it from being the blimp explosion, 10,000 people died that day from this disaster that happened over Manhattan. But others were horribly mutated, and a small fraction got superpowers. And thinking on this, as I said, they came to use the analogy of poker card game terms for the effects of the virus because it's random and increasingly low odds of each stage, that loosely there were three broad categories that they say nine out of ten infected people instantly die. It has a 90% kill rate. Only one in ten survive, and only one in ten of those survivors actually get superpowers. The rest are mutated into monsters, so we're talking literally 1% get superpowers, and they get nicknamed aces, that you drew an ace from the wild card. And that 9% of people who survived but were horribly mutated are nicknamed jokers, aces and jokers. And the 90% who instantly die are said to draw the Black Queen. However... Pretty much the main theme of the series is that these categories are artificial. First off, this was a world that had Golden Age Superman comic books from the late 1930s, right before it split off into this alternate history with young know, superpowered people and stuff. So they had Superman, they had some of the original stuff. When all this started, it began with the stereotype that, oh, well, I guess the Aces will be the superheroes. And the disgusting Jokers will be the supervillains, because they look like monsters. The Jokers aren't monsters, they're just horribly disfigured people. And many of the Aces abuse their powers. Heck, even, like, costumed superheroes really weren't a thing in this world. That it isn't, oh, this is how everyone's acting like some Rob Liefeld, poorly drawn image comics thing. They don't wear spandex, many of them aren't even career superheroes or supervillains. Most wild carters from both groups, aces or jokers, are just people trying to live their lives. They don't act as villains or, or superheroes. Particularly because most jokers don't have superpowers, they're just disfigured. Now, most aces, and originally they were in the low dozens before their numbers increased, but most aces just became famous celebrities. <laughs> like on radio and TV, and sometimes they did superheroic, sometimes not. The Jokers, meanwhile, become the new marginalized subgroup of the late 20th century, living on the streets and in slums. Now, New York City still has the largest wild carter population of anywhere in the world, and all the Jokers there gradually coalesce into the slum district known as the Bowery. It's a real street wedged between, like, the Lower East Side and Chinatown, but below Houston, but up from the bridge. I mean... I, I'm in New York City. I actually used to work near the Bowery briefly. And in the early 20th century, it was basically New York's Skid Row. Skid Row is the name of the specific slum district of Los Angeles, but today has become a byword for slums in general. So New York's Skid Row was the Bowery. It's not even a real neighborhood. It's like the borderland between other better-defined neighborhoods. It's like next to Chinatown, next to Little Italy, it's Blow House, and it's near Lower East. It's not really fitting in one place. It's, you know how you always push, like, the trains and warehouses at the edge of your neighborhood? Well, the other neighborhood pushed theirs, too, and because it's where, like, three, five neighborhoods connect, it became the region underneath the elevated train tracks running down this strip where it's just cheap housing, so there's, like, cheap bars flop houses, uh, just junk, and there, it was infamous for there's just drunks and bums and homeless people on the street there. And nowadays it's different from that. This is for like almost 100 years the Bowery existed. 
Nowadays, due to you know, urban development, it's mostly where they put all of the restaurant supply stores now. Like, if you walk down there, there aren't bars of any kind, there aren't restaurants of any kind, or whorehouses or whatever. It's like restaurant supply stores and warehouses. But at the time, and like Christie Street is next to it, the Bowery is there. Point is, it is a physical place you could go to, but in their alternate history, it ne never stopped being a slum district, which it was in 1946. In their timeline, because New York has the biggest Joker population, enough that they form a subgroup, they all coalesce there because no one else will have them. And this is like classic immigration patterns, that when you look at when new immigrants come in, they come in whatever at the time happened to be the cheapest location. And because then everyone else aggregates to the foothold they had, it turns into the ghetto of whatever that particular group was. So just because the Bowery happened to be a really cheap place at the time and nowhere else would have them, they all coalesced there, squatting some cheap flop houses, and it becomes this Joker ghetto, nicknamed Joker Town. And what I really, really love about this series, as a fan of X-Men comics, well, with few exceptions, I think the X-Men comics, to, to their disservice, generally tended to focus on the beautiful or rich superpowered mutants fighting other rich superpowered mutants or giant robots or evil scientists who could afford their own lab. Given the whole premise of the X-Men comics, what I really thought was more interesting were th storylines exploring the Morlocks, or just everyday random mutants who are just teen runaways, or people just trying to get by who don't... They're not all what they call Omega-level mutants, like Magneto or Jean Grey. That is just, I look like a werewolf, but I don't really have particularly big powers, or my skin is green, that's it. And just how they try to deal with all the discrimination and stuff, that they don't really have huge powers and everything. So, things like the District X series, where they had Bishop with District X, which was a similar concept, or particularly with the Morlocks. I'm thinking, of of course, of the, the animated series, which they've uh, returned to now with X-Men 97. Those were, you know, like season two, I think, is when they did the Morlocks and that. That was a really interesting angle I wanted them to explore more, which they, they did, but not enough, that there is sort of a divide between mutants who can pass off as human and those with physical abnormalities too obvious to hide. I mean, Jean Grey or Rogue can walk around on the street in the daytime and pass for human. And even if people know they're mutants, they're less likely to have a visual reaction to them. But we're talking like the mutants who can't pass for human, who are either heavily discriminated, they're heavily discriminated against, can't, therefore unemployed, thus homeless. So over time there becomes this large population of homeless mutants, and they say most of their powers turn on to puberty, a lot of them are runaways, that there becomes this large homeless population of mutants that can't pass for human, who get dubbed the Morlocks, because a lot of them are squatting in the city sewers, living underground, hiding from view. Though I think the Morlocks are this specific group in New York City, but it kind of, kind of became a nickname for any mutants that can't pass and have to hide. I really think that would have been better to explore more. I mean, they only vaguely mention in passing, like, the resentment of the mutants who can't pass for human to the ones who can. And, like, what about, do you feel bad that, like, you know, Cyclops can technically pass for human with a little cosmetic, you know, he, he puts his glasses on, or... I really felt bad that that gifted show on Fox got cancelled when they got bought by Disney, that a good idea they had was that Polaris dyes her green hair black so she can pass off in society on missions. And would they have them pointing out, like, you know, oh, you get to pass and I don't, to Blink or something? I wish they'd played around with that, of the resentment that Blink can't really pass. They brought it up a little. But that, that passing is a thing that comes up with all sorts of marginalized groups. I mean, not just like LGBT stuff of are you cisgender passing or not, which is a thing. But like, um, do you dress, dress in ethnic attire? Or do you, you know, like, do you, do you, are you like an Orthodox Mandalorian 
wear, wearing your yarmulke and everything, or do you try to give up your cultural uniqueness and just try to, do you try to pass off as the mainstream, or is that an abandonment to yourself? Big question, because it's not just for Bleeding Heart, it's fundamentally, it's hard to feel bad for Jean Grey when she can pass for human and lives in a rich guy's mansion. I'm not saying he's what you call a, a, the, the sugar daddy. He, no, he's a te he runs a school for the gifted. <laughs> it's just the it kind of skews that the X Men live in a mansion, and the better ones are when they go on the road and meet suffering mutants out there in the world who are dealing with these problems, or just the mutant communities that have popped up that don't have all of that is more interesting to me of the logical ripple effects on a societal scale that there's, like, large groups of homeless mutants. Now, that was another thing the Gifted show actually did explore, well, I'm sorry it got cancelled, that they did a good job of emphasizing in that show where they mentioned mutants are the lowest rung of society, so like with any new immigrant group or something like that, they take the worst jobs that no one else wants to do. So, like, uh, manual labor with no benefits, or they in The Gifted they mention a disproportionate number of mutants are in the military because they can't get any other work, and the military always wants warm bodies. So just things that it's the poor suffering the most, that, that yeah, that's logically what would happen. They fill in the lowest rung of society like that because of the hierarchy and everything. And... The thing with wild cards is it's as if you made a series focusing more on the Morlocks than on the X-Men. I mean, the Aces are in it, and they're, but they interact with Jokers a lot. And even the Morlocks, you can there, there's some technical lip service in the X-Men universe that mutants, even Morlocks, like a werewolf or a uh, fish boy or something... Oh, technically, this is the next phase in human evolution. It's an evolutionary radiation that's radiating out in various forms. But allegedly, there's supposed to be improvements in some form or another. The Jokers are not that at all. This is not even paying lip service to the next stage in human evolution. It's a random alien virus. And most of them don't have anything that could be remotely described as a superpower, they're just horrifyingly crippled, genuinely disabled in a medical sense, many of them. I said that the point of this is the imposed categories are artificial, not just the moral categories. I said, well, the idea of, oh, these are the good ones, those are the bad ones, it's artificial. You tell that pretty quickly when there's ace villains, but they do make it a point that even physically, scientifically, the categories of ace and joker aren't really accurate because it's more of a spectrum. This is a theme in all of Martin's stuff that, like, they act like the free folk beyond the wall in Westeros are very different, and then John goes there and says, we just put up a wall. They're not that different from us. I mean, they speak, most of them speak our language. We have the same religion as the Starks because they follow the old gods. They're people, and they, we make all of these artificial categories to you divide people. So you see that theme running through his work, and they did this with wild cards, that even the categories of Ace and Joker are inaccurate because it's more of a spectrum. In some ways, it's kind of like, remember when, for the autistic spectrum, they removed Asperger's as a thing, of, oh, well, high-functioning autism we'll call Asperger's, to somehow set it apart and better than that it was always a spectrum. So... Why are we making categories for this is, is what would you call the not autistic, the not Asperger's, but autistic people? It are you going to make up a, a derogative term for that or something, like Rain Man or something? I don't know, but they're right. that In terms of, you know, you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. It's such a spectrum of uniqueness that you can't really impose these medical categories on it because it's inaccurate, if nothing else that there are Jokers who technically do have superpowers. Not all of them, not even most of them, but many of them do have what we would call superpowers, like someone who turned into a ten-foot-tall troll with skin of granite and super strength. Or, or, or like Beast from X-Men. If Beast from X-Men in his form was in the Wildcards universe, 
they wouldn't consider him an ace. They would con- they they came up with this ad hoc name that oh if they're a joker but have useful superpowers, we call them joker aces. <laughs> Just oh they're, well they're joker aces because the 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 border between the two is fuzzy. I mean, they also say different countries came up with different names for the superpowered human-looking ones and the disfigured ones. That in the UK, Joker in the United Kingdom and Britain, they call Joker aces knaves after poker because um in the United States in poker, the card below queen but above 10 we call jacks. UK, they're called knaves. So, essentially, consider if the Joker aces are jacks, that they're jokers who have useful superpowers. But they point out it's arbitrary. <laughs> and for that matter, there's some mostly human looking ones, but with the, they have superpowers, they look mostly human, but have clear physical differences. Uh, case in point, Peregrine. Uh, she's basically like Archangel from X Men, that she's a normal looking human who is capable of flight because she has angelic wings growing out of her back. But because she's physically still what's considered beautiful, angelic, everyone treats her like an ace, the media calls her an ace, and she's treated like a celebrity. Even though she herself insists, I'm a joker. I don't look baseline human. I have wings coming out of my back. So it's the arbitrary biases of everything. And on top of it, the whole thing that it's a spectrum, they even use the poker term deuce for weak aces that don't have very useful powers. Which is, it's just, you're making categories where none existed. And hell, even the people who die, the Black Queens, it's not, oh, well, 9 out of 10 die, but the others survive. It, it is a spectrum even for them that they point out the Black Queens are just jokers who had mutations so drastic that they weren't biologically sustainable. It's not picking between one or the other. That's the same root thing is happening to everyone who gets the virus. It's just sometimes it's expressed very subtly and you're called an ace. Sometimes it's drastic, but you survive and it's called a joker. And sometimes it's so drastic, you, it's physically can't sustain, you can't live like that. So if you're like turned into a living puddle and you, you die or something, or you fall apart, that that's all it is. So, thinking on it, if I was describing what are the features of this that make it so great compared to X-Men comics, there are four major aspects of this series, this world, because it's an ongoing world and just a sandbox to play in, but there's four things that I think really set it apart. As a fan of X-Men comics who still wanted a gritty adult version of it, that was the first thing, that it focuses a lot more than X-Men did on their version of the Morlocks, who do not live like rich celebrities in Xavier Mansion, but just like runaways living homeless on the streets. And this is a realistic take on this. And that they're this oppressed minority and marginalized. Second point of two, well, the second and third are related. The second point is that time actually advances in this series. That the first book has time skips, so it starts in 1946, but by the end it's 1986, which at the time was the present day. And then all subsequent books since then have loosely advanced in real time relative to publication. I think the most recent one might be up to year 2000 or something. They might have slowed down a little, but generally time passes on a generational scale in this. It's not perpetually The Simpsons where time is standing still or something and the, the mutant kids that never grow up because they have to be the teen version. Again, it's a lot like how Watchmen did this, actually, with Alan Moore, that Watchmen, the main story, is set in 1986, but goes back 50 years to different historical eras of how the public reacted to superheroes, from the Golden Age, late 30s Minutemen, through the 1950s, when the anti-communist groups had a crackdown on them. And that was the same time there's a crackdown on comic books with, with, with the anti-comics code. And then through the second generation of Silver Age heroes in the 1960s, the Watchmen crime busters. And they end Watchmen sort of at the start of the Bronze Age in the 70s. Well, that was the 80s by that point. But 
with over 40 years of differences, it's a true alternate history by the time you get to the present day ones. When you get to the ones that are in the 80s and 90s, like so there's 40 or 50 years of different history. So as an alternate history fan, it's also kind of fun. Just the world has developed differently. That Well, they're focused mostly on the U.S. and Manhattan, so they don't talk about the rest of the world too much, but uh, the Cuban Revolution never happened. Uh, Gandhi wasn't assassinated, so India was never partitioned, but this also meant the nationalists in the Congress didn't have much of a rallying cry for unity. So they mentioned that India is the entire subcontinent, but it's only a loose confederation, as opposed to two united countries that split apart from each other, or three now. But they mentioned little things like that. There's another full book set in what the UK, how they handled wild cards. It varies by country. Uh, East Asia was one of the last places to get hit by the wild card in, in, in small numbers, so they go like aces and... and they're not as discriminated against in East Asia because there aren't that many of them. Uh, other thing, it varies by country, but and there's all this other stuff. I mean, there's also a thing that like wild card or extremists carve out their own national homeland in Central America, like Krakoa. But th they don't go into that too much. But just even on the local level, like the world is different. H history went differently. People weren't assassinated who were that kind of thing. So. Time actually advances in this, and some of the older characters, main characters from the initial books, eventually die of old age, because time is advancing to, to that point. That's the second thing I thought was interesting about this. The third thing related to that is the writers emphasized a major rule in this story verse is that dead characters stay dead, that they don't want cheap comic book resurrections. And because the story covers, so they cover all these decades and people stay dead, there's some die of old age. That in, in many ways points two and three here, that time advances and that the dead stay dead. Kind of similar to the realistic take by a Marvel Ultimate. Like, if you like the Marvel Ultimate universe, they have those rules. The time advances, death is permanent. So, like, imagine a Marvel Ultimate title that hyper-realistically focused on the Morlocks. <laughs> that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. But the fourth and last major feature is the one that kind of made this near and dear to me. Just the, How do you describe the tone? Is very adult and melancholy. That It's like the tone of A Song of Ice and Fire, that things used to be better, is a major feeling in Martin's books. That, Well, I, already, I said it's gritty, melancholy. It, there's a sense of melancholy that a lot of people are traumatized. That all the characters are traumatized. This, this random event beyond their control happened to them and totally upended their lives. They're not having fun with this. This is a story about traumatized people. Someone who is just going about their day, keeping their head down, working hard, and then an alien virus turned them into a werewolf or a blob monster. Just like that. And they didn't deserve this. The, the small normal people being battered around by larger forces beyond their control. What I'm trying to aim at is that a lot of these writers, case in point Martin, who first developed the series in the mid-1980s, these writers were heavily affected by living through the Vietnam War, and many were members of the anti-war movement. I mean, Martin himself was a conscientious objector. He's explained how, by blind luck, I got a draft board who said, oh yeah, you'll be branded a coward forever, so we will grant your conscious objector status, conscientious objector, and Martin has also remarked, and you can tell from his writings, that he doesn't regret that, but he feels bad about other people who got drafted and had to go anyway and didn't want to, or got theirs turned down by their board, and the guilt of people went and got smashed, killed, and maimed in a stupid war that was executed stupidly, if nothing else, the leadership didn't know what they were doing, and just the madness of that, and that we grew up thinking the U.S. was, was oh, we're the good guys, and then all the corrupt things that the military-industrial complex was doing, like CIA meddling in third-world countries we really shouldn't have been doing, that, well, who are the good guys here? We're fighting, we're doing very dirty things, you're hurting your own people with this draft stuff, and, and just there was this big sense of disillusionment by the 70s and early 80s after living through all of that and everything that happened. I think about, like, John Rambo coming back home 
and that stupid sheriff running him out of town because he didn't want a drifter in his town, even though he was a hero who won a, a, a Medal of Honor, and now he's get, getting thrown out of a diner in Shit Hill, was, uh, Washington or something. And, and he didn't draw first blood, you know. But um, it, that kind of thing. The thing that really goes to in my mind, I don't know why, is it things like the movie Forrest Gump, when Lieutenant Dan comes back, it's late 70s point, when Lieutenant Dan comes back from Vietnam, his legs have been blown off, and he's just living as a derelict in this very filthy-looking late 1970s New York City where the economy was bad because of all the war stuff, the economy was bad, a lot of bitter, wounded veterans who were just, that was the wrong war, I didn't agree with it, or just, it didn't amount to anything. And now, and it's over anyway, the communist Scott South Vietnam we pulled out and now what do we do that just living in, in, in renting an apartment in a slum in New York City drinking a, a big vodka thing to get drunk every day to get the pain away that just and those were the unlucky ones but even for like the, the authors these are a group of authors obviously they were had their lives together but the mental effect of living through that and seeing so many of their ideals tarnished and so many things that could have happened to them or other people just getting wasted. So the general sense of disillusionment in the wake of the Vietnam War that these writers had all lived through. When the stories are set for Wild Cards, most of the stories are about a lot of the down-and-out jokers living in a slum in Lower Manhattan and discriminated against. And there's a lot of, of drugs, there's a lot of sex, um, the, the, the drugs and just these are people who are strung out. Hunter S. Thompson makes a cameo at one point of just down-and-out in Joker Town, that just this is the dregs of these are people with no hope, their lives have been ruined. And that disillusionment, that tone really struck with me. It stuck with me that even in the later books, anytime someone catches the wild card virus and gets mutated by it, the feeling isn't, oh cool, I'm an oppressed X-Man and my, I'm a mutant and I should be mutant proud. It's random forces outside of our control ruining our lives in an instant. And the disillusionment that comes from that comparable to all that uh, disillusionment after Vietnam. And I, I know this is esoteric, but I think a lot of that resonates today more than ever. And not just, well, obviously, because of the COVID-19 pandemic was the biggest and most recent thing of an obvious parallel, but we were all working hard, playing by the rules, kept our heads down, we did everything right, we followed the rules, and then along came covid not just that it killed a lot of people. I mean, that if you've, if you've lost anyone, I can't. I can't imagine. I didn't. But how it and it wrecked the the knock on effects of it wrecked the global economy. It'll take years to overcome the lingering effects of that, and the the larger scale economic slowdown because of it. But even extending back from that, I'm talking about I'm trying to put this in words. I say this with the disillusionment of a millennial that they told us, work hard, you need to get college degrees to get a real job, so go on, go to undergrad, go to graduate school, oh, but you'll be set once you have a master's and a PhD, whatever, That, and then the 2008 <laughs> Wall Street recession hit, that through no fault of our own, just from the greed of some people, that didn't need to happen, there was a giant recession just as soon as millennials were hitting college age or coming out of college. And we didn't do anything wrong. It was the people at the top abusing things, or even if it was like a natural disaster, like, again, well, COVID people mismanaged, but it would have been a problem anyway, that when COVID hit a decade later, it's just something this silly. It kind of reminds me almost of Attack on Titan, that originally anyway, that Attack on Titan was a metaphor for, like, the trauma of sometimes random bad things just happen that, like, I was doing everything right on my farm, and then this crazy-looking titan creature ran up and ate my parents. That the surrealism is part of the insult. That this wasn't part of, well, you know, this is part of life. No, no, this is decidedly not part of life. Titan running up and doing this. So, oh, well, you know, sometimes bad things happen to good people. No, 
Random crazy alien viruses should not be happening to normal people. This isn't normal. This is an outside context thing that happened to us. Like war. War is inherently insane. No one, it's not supposed to be part of the normal fabric of life. And if you get maimed in war, or just you get your youth taken away by being drafted, and then all this other stuff with the economic downfall, this is an outside context thing that you had no control over that drastically affected your life. So just thank you for millennials in general. I mean, we had 9-11 itself, then we had two decades of forever war in the background, tapering off, finally ending, because the invasions right after 9-11 were stupid and poorly thought out. That was a problem. Then the 2008 economic recession, and just as after we clawed back for 10 years from the Wall Street recession over all the subprime mortgage stuff, 10 years later, all right, okay, that was right after we got out of college, we had to work jobs just to get by, but we're finally going somewhere. Then COVID hit. So we got screwed over twice in a decade at the early part of our lives. And a big thing is... It is the poorest who always suffer the most. And I am not the poorest. I am not the bottom of the pyramid. All those things you saw during COVID on TV of working class people or people on the poverty threshold were devastated. I mean, I, you know, I'm annoyed I didn't work for three years. Eventually I did. But people who were, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, trying to raise their kids because they didn't have generational wealth were just, they had no safety net to fall back onto. So that devastated them. That it's always the poorest who suffer the most. And it's always the rich who can weather bad things well. So it's that whole parallel of, there's a tiny percent at the top, the aces, who got through this, arguably benefited from it. And the larger number of people who got stuck, mutated as jokers, are dead. And that this isn't the story of the aces so much as it's the story of the categories and bad things happening beyond our control. It's not, hooray, aces are cool. That's really just a conscious. Some of the aces are good people, a lot of them actually, but others not so much. And just, it, all of, I know I'm rambling, but all this just resonates so much of random bad things happened that changed the trajectory of our entire lives let's just say COVID for, for short, and no one deserved it. The X-Men is about the next stage in human evolution and identity politics. That they, I said they are mutants, but it, it's, it's their identity. But getting the wild card virus and one out of ten odds you'll live, and then nine out of ten you'll be a freak, you could just as easily have been an ace. That's the point. It's not, well, you were always going to be an uh, X-Men mutant. It's one in ten, you could have still looked human, but randomly, nine out of ten odds, you look like a monster. And it is entirely random. It could have gone the other way, it simply didn't. And there's this big bias that jokers are unlucky. Because it could have happened to you, is the, the thing that... It, it, luck of the cards. Random thing. The, the randomness is what hurts me more than anything else. And the trauma, the on top of that, the insult of... Something completely like a when like a farm get a town gets destroyed by a random tornado or something or or a meteor strike or an earthquake or something that we did everything right and something bad still happened and the randomness of it like the, the randomness of Bruce Wayne's parents being brutally murdered and mugging that it was random freaks everyone out and just the disillusionment they have of. An outside thing happened to me, which I had no control over, and was I just this unlucky, and I'm powerless against it. And how everyone is just really burned out. I mentioned how, so it's a lot of psychological trauma stuff, I, rem I mentioned how the virus first got unleashed by the hero pilot Jet Boy, try trying to stop criminals from detonating it in the blimp over Manhattan. Well... He managed to crash land into the blimp, and he's fighting the head bad guy, his nemesis. And this guy who parachuted out saw their final confrontation, that the villain pulled a pistol, shot him in the chest, and with his last ounce of strength and adrenaline, he surged forward at him anyway and said, I can't die yet. 
I haven't seen the Jolson story. And Jet Boy, right before it exploded, and Jet Boy's last words became this famous phrase in their world. It's on the Jet Boy Memorial. I can't die yet. I haven't seen the Jolson story. The idea is at the beginning, when they explain this, that right before he took off, Jet Boy had promised his old girlfriend that he'd go on this one last mission, and when he returned, they'd go and see the big movie that just happened to be in theaters at the time was a movie called The Jolson Story. So really, directly compare this, I know, directly compare this to, like, the end of the first Captain America movie, when he promised Peggy Carter over the radio, he promised her, this is our last mission, I'm going to come back alive, and we'll finally go on our first date, we're going to go dancing together, because I was too bashful before. But instead, he's trapped on a crashing plane, but can still talk to her over the radio, and he's going to crash into the Arctic, he's going to die, but he's talked to her on the radio... And he half-heartedly, pathetically, melancholy, knowing he's going to die, they both know he's going to die, or think he will, he half-heartedly mouths, Don't worry, Peggy, I'll be all right. I can't be late for our date dancing, can I? And he knows, he knows well, I can't die now, I'm going to go dancing. He, he says mournfully as he's facing death. Sarcastically. And then 70 years later, he wakes up and says, well, I had a date. But that whole thing of him going down in the in the Valkyrie plane and... I can't miss our date, can I? That the whole point is Jet Boy has just been fatally shot, knows he's fate, fatally shot on an exploding blimp, and half defiantly, half ruefully, he just, he's strangling the villain back, goes, well, I can't die. I haven't seen the Jolson story. That it turned into this catchphrase, uh, this bitter catchphrase among the Jokers and the world in general because of all the ripple effects. Basically, the way it's used is think like pretty teenage girl graduates high school, is on her way to college on a paid scholarship, then suddenly catches the wildcard virus and transforms into a horrific half-spider, half-octopus mutant. That, like that randomly, purely randomly, from an outside event, you are traumatized, your life as you knew it is shot. It is over. That, imagine if right after being turned into this spider-squid monster, she bitterly, half-bitterly, half-pathetically says, but I can't catch the wild card. I was going to see the Jolson story. That was, instead of, I was going to go to college, it's, but I was going to see the Jolson story. It becomes this self-referential catchphrase for my my life and dreams were ruined and I had a life that I was going to have before this outside event happened to me that I can't die yet I haven't seen the Jolson story became this byword for lives shattered and dreams unfulfilled some of you might remember two years ago I was quoting that phrase a lot that um, my five-year-old cat uh, suddenly wasn't fearing, feeling very well two months after Christmas, and the doctors found out that he had a massive inherent heart defect. It was a birth defect. It was always there, and just it got bad really suddenly, and they said he had a year to live at best, and he only lived one month. And I always knew I'd outlive him, but we raised him with his brother, and he wasn't even at the halfway point of his life, and he was... He was Spitfire was going to have a decade or more of getting into adventures and doing stuff with his brother, and he was going to, but that didn't happen. So when I picked him up from the cat hospital, I, you know, I was talking about, I'm really, my schedule is smashed for months at least, I, I have to deal with this. I brought him back from the hospital, I took a short video of showing he was eating comfortably in his own house again for a couple of weeks, but the day he came back, I took a photo of him, put my hand on him, and I... I love him, and I, and I the, the only thing I said on the video, I titled it with quotation marks as if he was saying it, I can't die yet, I haven't seen the Jolson story. And a month after that he died. Peacefully in his sleep, at least. But, but that, that phrase really st stuck with me, of some completely random outside event that had nothing to do with our own actions and it wiped away lives and dreams or yeah keep in mind i was i was completely 
I was loopy about that for the rest of 2022. You guys saw, I'm sorry about that, but realize that was the last straw. I keep telling you, you understand this was in the string of things that I hadn't worked in two years because I'd been in pandemic lockdown for two years in my own house. I was kind of freaking out just from lockdown and I was holding it together on adrenaline. But this on top of all the other pandemic stuff, just the last straw I couldn't take anymore. And I really, I, I really turned to jello for a couple of months there through the rest of 2022. And I was angry at everyone. I'm sorry about that. But just, it, it was, uh, that, that was the breaking point where I couldn't handle that on top of all the other stuff. And it was like the exclamation point at the end of a terrible two years where there's this pandemic and people are dying and it's really upsetting and everything is going on and the politics of it and war and stuff. And th this was right after Russia invaded Ukraine, but before the Ukrainians repulsed them. But everything going bad in the world and the news and just I, I just mentally checked out after that. So that was sort of my plea for, but he had a life ahead of him, was, I can't die yet. I haven't seen the Jolson story. So, or like Vietnam vets with their legs blown off. Like, imagine Lieutenant Dan saying, but I was going to see the Jolson story. Or, or, or Bubba or something of just that we had lives and dreams, that outside things, bad things happen to good people, and dealing with the trauma of that. And that is something Wild Cards does that X-Men never really did, and in some ways couldn't, because they were always born as mutants. Just turns on to puberty, but, well, why did this happen to me, of all people? Well, it's in your genes, but Wild Cards, it is very much an external force. It's an alien virus. It is passed on genetically, but not getting into that. So, yeah, now with all these problems going on in the world, the economy, war all sorts of horrible things the past 20 years, really, going back to 9-11. I think the traumatized, particularly because of COVID, I think the traumatized characters and setting of wild cards would resonate pretty strongly now. And if they push to get it animated, it could be the next Invincible. But it's not even George R. R. Martin really driving it at this point. He puts his name on each new book as nominally the editor, just to be nice, to help out other less well-known writers who makes stories in the series now. He hasn't really written for it since the 90s. He edited a few. It's a collaborative writing effort. And even if Martin is never involved again, I think those other writers might one day, on their own, get it turned into a pretty good adult cartoon series. So, the reason I made this video, audio-only podcast, I don't have time to put images in, was just to give an explanation to any new people here who didn't really know about it. Oh, because we were joking about, oh, now we have to, Martin said, Winds of Winter, he didn't make good progress this year. What's he going to do, make a bunch of wild cards updates? And I made a joke poll on my Twitter thing of, hey, you guys want wild cards content? <laughs> I was joking, but, um... So many people, because ten years ago people would have gotten that joke, but ten years on now... Martin hasn't been blogging that much about wild cards or other stuff that a lot of people didn't even know what wild cards was. They hadn't heard the name, and even 10 years ago, people who had didn't know what it was about. That what is wild cards? Why do people keep making fun of it? Well, it was a lighthearted joke of, well, no winds of winter news, but wild cards. And I feel bad that it, it stopped being that punchline, turned into a punchline against Martin when really it had nothing to do with slowing down his work. He wasn't really doing it. I mean, by comparison, a new thing Martin is supporting but not working on now is that crime show Dark Winds with the Native American police officers in Southwest. Martin is, he's mentioning it pretty frequently now, but he didn't write that series at all. It was a finished series years ago. It was written by someone else. His involvement is purely a money thing, and you get producer credit for he's funding it. And Martin's a great guy who helps out other writers, funds new projects, it, or he also promoted N.K. Jemison's stuff, or like half a dozen other up-and-coming writers who he liked, so he helped promote them. Not taking writing time away at all. It's purely a money thing. It's purely because he's paying it forward. So what now? Is like Dark Winds going to be the punching bag if he makes a blog update that the next Dark Winds season premiere? Oh, why aren't you writing Winds of Winter? Why were you working on Dark Winds, George? He wasn't working on it. He was helping other writers, because that's what he does. 
because you, you lift up other writers. That's the right way to do it, not run off and try to make Star Wars movies on your own. So, is Dark Winds going to be the punching bag now, or are gonna, people going to keep making fun of wild cards? We're kind of due for a new wild cards. I think there was one last year, but... <sighs> he hasn't actually written for wild cards, written, written, since the 1990s, barring one short story in 2008 to launch something else. It's mostly handed off to other writers, and... If you actually sit down and look at the fictional universe of Wild Cards, it's if you liked Alan Moore's Watchmen, if you liked Robert Kirkman's Invincible, and if you liked the Song of Ice and Fire novels and their deconstructionist tone, taking it from high fantasy to low fantasy, it's if X-Men is high fantasy, and the genre he worked in called low fantasy, where it's gritty, dark, and realistic, it's the low fantasy version of X-Men like in, in, with the Morlocks in District X. And it's psychologically developed enough. It's not just adventure, it's text, it's characters dealing with trauma. I think Wild Cards is actually well worth your time to read. If you're the type of person who actually sits down and reads books or entertainment still. I mean, some people say they do, but if you are looking for content to read... Just try the first one. If you don't like the first one, don't do the red, but try the first book. It's actually really good and an intriguing setting. If you have truly read all of his other stuff first, I mean, don't do this if you haven't read the world book, Fire and Blood and Duncan Egg, the Duncan Egg collection. But if you're a fan of X-Men comics and a fan of George R. Martin, yes, this is well worth your time. I'm happy he worked on this. I appreciate that he's still supporting it, and I'm happy that other writers will be continuing it for years to come, because like Marvel and Image, it's an ongoing storyverse. 